month, NASM is giving you free courses. That's right, free courses each month just for being part of the NASM family. Learn about everything ranging from nutrition to strength, weight loss to stress relief, and everything in between. Click the link in the bio for information and to claim your free course before they're gone. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of the Master Instructor Roundtable. I'm Marty Miller, Regional Master Instructor, and as always, here with my fellow Regional Master Instructor, Miss Wendy Batts. How are you today, Wendy? I'm great, Marty. How are you? Awesome. Like I always say, it's my favorite time of the week. <laughs> Mine too. Mine too. And you know what better topic to discuss other than knee part two? <laughs> Without a doubt. So for those that are just joining us right now, clearly you can see this is the second part of a topic. So anything we reference, we're going to talk about a bunch of stuff, but definitely encourage you to go back and look at part one. And we'll talk about what, uh, you know, we'll review a couple things that we went over. But today we're going to get a little more into the program design type of stuff. Yes. Um, and to your point, I think in part one, we really did go a lot into anatomy and we needed to really kind of just break it up and let you guys know that the knee is kind of a joint that follows what the ankle and hip does. And so I really think that if you didn't see part one, you should definitely go back and uh, we will do a quick review today so we can you know jump right on in and and start some of the review and then we're going to spend some time talking about program design and uh you know marty before we actually kind of dive in one thing i was thinking about earlier today is you know we've talked so many we've done a lot of these of, of course and we've talked about a lot of different joints and things that could quote go wrong and then ways that we can really enhance better movement pattern better, better quality of living, um, you know, to help people with discomfort in those areas. But I think one thing I wanted to point out is, guys, when we start talking about program design and you have some of these clients in your new, if what I would suggest is go and take a screenshot of some of these programs, because then you can just easily reference, oh, this person had knee valgus or even when we did foot and ankle, this you know person had you know, their feet flattened, their feet externally rotated. We went over tons of ways to help correct some of those compensations with exactly what to roll, stretch, activate, and then some some good exercises that you could easily do or have your clients do at home. So when we get to the knee, I um, wanted just to kind of say the same thing. Take a mental note, take your camera, do something like that because it is, it's a quick way to reference. And, you know, Marty and I have spent a lot of times in the trenches, so we know that this stuff actually works. <laughs> and uh, just kind of wanted to throw that out there so maybe it'll help. Yeah. And we've said this before, the best way to learn is learn by doing and learn by doing it properly. So if you have the right you know, script, then it's easier to, to learn by doing. And then when it's funny that you were talking about, you know, thinking about things earlier today, I was for all of the people in here that are certified through NASM, you know, probably of our certified personal trainer page on Facebook. And lo and behold, someone had posted a video and we were talking about a lot of the biomechanical things. So, you know, we definitely try to pour into all of you to continue to build upon that knowledge. So this is one area that you can do it. But then also, again, we have that certified personal trainers Facebook page as well. Yes, definitely take advantage of some of this stuff. And that's why when we did our, did you know that this is all that NASN is trying to provide you guys? We really want to make sure that we are hitting topics that you guys want us to talk about as well. So really good place to either email Marty and I, which our contact information is always given to us at the, or given to you guys at the end. But you can definitely find us both there on that page because we're very active in trying to help some of our trainers that may have questions on on topics and areas that we feel comfortable trying to provide some support. You got it. So Perfect. there you have so it. Time to get moving into well, Let's too. go into it. Yes. Uh, so today, again, we're just going to do a quick, uh, brief recap on the anatomy of the knees. It talks just quickly about the bones, joints, and some of the muscles. Uh, we're going to then talk about common movement impairments. I know you guys have seen these. Unfortunately, we are starting to see them more and more in some of our youth. So I, that's why I feel that these topics specifically are going to help people, um, you know, starting young and that are active, how we can try to help enhance their life moving forward before injury occurs. And then we are going to give you some program design considerations off of those impairments that we discuss. Yeah, And, you know, Wendy, I think, um, you know, you said in, in the trenches, I'm going to date myself. I've been doing this for almost 30 years between as I went through college in and, 
you know, I used to deal with a lot of clients that were runners that had knee pain because they ran forever. And I'm starting to see a curve now that we still have our runners, but with this big shift over the last 10 years of high intensity, I'm now starting to see a lot of people that have done high intensity for 10 years where they were more worried about the volume and the intensity and the, you know, they weren't really worried about form and technique as we would. I see some people now starting to get some wear and tear just like our runners used to when it was early on in our career. So this is, I think, very pertinent information because of what we see going on in the industry that you really need to know the self care for that lower extremity, including the knee. Well, it's funny that you say that I have a client that I see um, usually more for maintenance. And so I do a lot of manual therapy, but then I also write a lot of programs that they can do on their own because they're very, very, um, dedicated to their program and their health. And so one thing that I have found um, with, with this particular individual, he is a big time runner and he has had zero pain in his ankles, his knees, his hips, but he's also very diligent about using his foam roller before he, you know, uh, goes out on his runs, does, you know, some specific stretches that I've given him and activation stuff, and then he'll run. And then before bed every night, he does hop back on his foam roller and stretches, which I, you know, that again can say, because you're doing the right stuff, you're having a really good outcome. This particular individual, Marty, ran a half marathon every weekend since wow. COVID has started and has had zero pain. And then I had another person that followed up with that that came in that has just started doing boot camp six months ago, did not have a trainer and thought that they were doing the right things before they went to boot camp. And now they're having ankle issues, they're having Achilles pain, they're having some, you know, a ton of, ton of things going wrong and their assessment. I mean, knowing that they've been jumping around on these high intensity type platforms and seeing what the knee is doing, it's very frightening. And so, you know, there is hope because I think it's really just a muscle imbalance type issue where we can really try to work on, on, you know, what we're going to talk about today, but just know guys that it doesn't matter the age. It doesn't matter the sport. You know, the assessments will tell you exactly what to do. You just have to follow it and be patient and realize it takes the body about four to six weeks to adjust and adapt to whatever it is that you're doing. And so patience is key and it's hard to get your clients to understand that, but just let them know that it's going to take repetitive, you know, time fixing what they have done. <laughs> so, and so. as I made in the comment today, if you don't fix it, you're only getting stronger at that movement dysfunction makes it harder to fix it. Not a matter of if it'll show up as a problem, it's a matter of when. Yes. Yes. Well, let's go into some of the basics here. So again, as a review, we're going to be talking about some of the major bones. So we're talking about your femur, your fibula, tibula, and your patella. And so you've got to think that the poor knee is kind of stuck in the middle. And because, and you're going to see this, even if we go to the next slide right away, um, when we start looking at what the knee does, you're going to see that it's mainly a hinge joint. And so Marty, I know that you went over this slide last week, but if you want to go ahead and take us through some of the different movements, that'd be great. Yeah, I went into a more detail last week, so we'll touch on it here. The key thing is it's primarily a hinge joint, which means it's primarily sagittal plane based. And the research shows us that when the knee goes into too much frontal plane and or transverse plane, bad things happen. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not small motions in around the joint in both planes of motion. So you'll see the valgus and varus. You'll see the anterior shifting front to back. And then we have the internal external rotation and you can go through. And, and like I said, I, I spent more time on this last week. So when we say the knee is a hinge joint, it's supposed to work primarily in the sagittal plane. Just understand to a very small extent, it will have some movement in the other planes. It's when we get to the excessive movement over time or rapidly under a lot of load where bad things happen. Yes. Usually, well, we would think it would be contact, but unfortunately, when you look at research and more and more knee issues are occurring and non-contact injuries. So people are, and when we say that, you know, we, we, had, we have said multiple times that injuries occur when you're decelerating, why we spend so much time, especially in phase one, working on the eccentric component of the, um, you know, muscles act action spectrum, but also when you're transverse. So when you're turning and decelerating. So for example, we had a master instructor that had said many times when we have, you know, taught with them, they would provide some stories and one of their clients um, that they just started seeing. So again, because know that they hadn't been working with this individual for very long, they went to go grab their keys because they were running late. They turned really quickly and blew out their knee. Yeah. So, and the one thing that I could say is, you know, there was comments that I've heard and seen like, you know, 
if it's not bothering you, don't worry about it. No, I'm very worried about it when I see bad movement. And I can give you some examples. You know, Wendy, you and I both had the privilege of working in elite sports, and we both have worked with athletes who used to be elite sports. And when they're in their 50s and 60s, all of a sudden now they are somewhat uh, limited in their ability to exercise because their knees are shot. You know, it could be their back and other things. And then when you look at what happens to their health as they age, you know, if your knees are not working well, good luck trying to be in really good shape, right? Yeah, you can get in the pool and you can do other things, but there's never been research that says as we age, let's just stop exercising. So we need to walk, we need to do elliptical, we need to do whatever it is to keep our body moving. And if you have that problem in the knee, your activity has to come down. Yes, you can work around it, we all have, but you, well, I'm trying to keep my knees healthy at this age. So they're healthy 25 years from now. Well, you know, proper movement is medicine. So that's what's going to lubricate your joints. And that's what's going to help keep them healthy. And you guys realize, you know, I used this analogy last week. But if you missed it, I mean, just think of your knee as a, a hinge joint, as Marty said, and think about a hinge and a door. And so if everything is lined up, the door is going to smoothly open and close. When there's when it starts to kind of come off the hinge, then it doesn't seed right. And when you try to close it or open it, it starts squeaking and things happen. Your body's the same way. And your knee joint, unfortunately, will do the same thing. It'll get all, you know, creaky and you'll, you know, start to sound like yeah, the Rice Krispie Treat snap, crackle, pop. Um, and it's a lot of it, you know, some of it's just natural. It's just movement. It's just aging. But some of it, you know, can lead to arthritis and, you know, other major issues if you don't really work on proper movement, proper alignment and making sure that the hinge itself is seated and stays seated correctly. So. But to go back to our conversation yesterday, those are Cocoa Krispies. That's just. Oh, right. Us, but <laughs> I like the regular ones, too, but I did add my own sugar. So yeah, there you go. Cocoa Krispies. <laughs> we'll, do a, we'll do a poll later. I'm just saying. Anyways. Uh, all right, moving time. on. <laughs> I had so to then, throw it in there. It was too I know. Uh, well, there you go. It used to be all about movie lines, but now that we yes. kind of lost Princess, we're just talking about cereal choices. So, oh, cereal. <laughs> um, but you know, just as a reminder, the the knee is made up of two joints. So again, we'd already talked about it being a hinge joint and a snowmobile joint with the two articulations. Two of the tar um, articulations being the tibial femoral joint, which is where the tibia and femur make up this joint. And so you guys can see the picture of that. And then you have, of course, the patella femoral joint. So it's where the patella and the femur make up this joint. And so, again, you want to think about where it tracks and make sure that everything is properly lined up. Because, again, if not, then you're going to start getting bone on bone. People start losing, losing some of their cartilage that, you know, helps it move smoothly. And then we start putting even more wear and tear on the actual ligaments that hold this sucker together. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's layman's terms, by the way. <laughs> you want to take this one? Certainly. So we went over the joints. Now we have to talk about what moves the joints. And we're looking again, everybody here knows that we're looking at how the muscles work together. So that way we have good joint arthrokinematics. So these are the muscles that are going to either function well. So the joint moves as that hinge primarily, or they're going to be overactive and underactive, causing the knee to be put into bad position. So the key muscles here are the adductor complex. Remember, there's more than one adductor. There's five adductors, but we are, we're going to look at that entire adductor complex, the gastroc and soleus. And then, of course, the glute max and glute medius are key stabilizers and have a function of the lower extremity and the knee. Then we have the medial and lateral hamstrings, which kind of, I look at them like uh, the strings on a shade. You know, you pull one too far and one end of the shade goes up, the other end drops. That medial and lateral hamstring have to work in cooperation to keep everything centered. Most people will have a lateral hamstring that's more dominant. Obviously our quadriceps are very key as it comes to what goes on at the knee. And then the TFL, as it from, goes from the hip, connects into the IT band and crosses the knee. So all these muscles are going to have a huge function of what goes on in the knee in different planes of motion, prime movers, synergists, stabilizers, all of that. So this is all those muscles that we have to take into account when we're looking at our programming for the knee. Well said. <laughs> And then if we move on, um, again, just talking about the pes planus distortion syndrome. So remember when we're talking about this, unfortunately, when somebody's um, feet flatten, 
and they have knee valgus, so meaning just that their knees cave in. You can think of the excess stress that's going on on the medial side of the knee and how long term this can disengage the lateral hip and the glute. That's why Marty said that the glutes are so important. And you want to think about what's happening at the knee and the muscles that are involved. And so that's why when we do the overhead squat, or we even have some people do the single leg squat, if we're not sure, we're really focusing on what's happening at the foot and ankle complex first, because if you see the feet flattening, you know, biomechanically, you're probably going to have knee valgus as well. And you're going to know right away, hey, I see these two things together. If we don't fix this, imagine now looking at this individual here, this drawing, I guess not really a person here. But if you have somebody that looks like this, and then you have them doing bounds or leaps or hops or jumps, I mean, just think of the excess force of your body weight and that movement. Um, and you're still if they don't have good ways of deceleration, how much pressure and stress this puts on the knee. And unfortunately, this is often times what you're going to see when somebody ends up having an issue with their ACL and quickly ends up, you know, t you know, blowing out that that particular ligament. So, yeah. And then a lot of times I see people that have this and their knee starts to bother them. And then all of a sudden they're they jump right over to the leg extension machine or this, that, the other, and they start addressing the knee which I'm sure there needs, there's work that needs to be done in and around the knee, but we also have to address what's going on at the foot and ankle to completely solve that problem. Yes. Well, that's why we're doing this today. So let's talk about some of this stuff. So then if we move on, um, we're going to start kind of getting more into again, just common, um, you know, uh, compensations that you're going to see once again, I'm going to stress this, Marty, you've stressed this every single time we've talked about anything with a compensation. If you see it during an assessment, even if it is slight, you are going to mark it down as being there. If it's visible in just five, you know, squats, um, then you know, as that individual gets more tired, then that is going to become more of a major compensation. And so just addressing it right away, um, even if it's slight, will really help impact the program as well as long-term performance. And so just as you guys can see, knees turning in, knee valgus, um, knees turning out or facing outwards is more knee varus. However, this is a very, I think, uncommon compensation. I mean, you'll see it because people do, you know, especially if you have people that ride horses or something like that, you may see this compensation more depending on what they do for a living. However, if you see knee varus, I strongly suggest doing a single leg squat to see if at that point the knee then goes into knee valgus. And if that does happen, then you would treat it as knee valgus and your and your program design component. And then, of course, knee dominant. So you've got someone, um, as you can see with this individual, they, you know, they're coming up off their heel. They're keeping their back pretty vertical. A lot of times um, when this happens, I think uh, I said vertical, didn't I? I meant horizontal. Well, no, I knew it, was vertical. it would be vertical, right? Or horizontal. Yes, you're good. You're yes good. vertical. Okay. I'm like confusing myself here. But if you do see someone with a flat back, you want to make sure too, when they're doing this, do they understand how to squat? And if you go through the proper squatting mechanics and they still are showing more knee dominance and they do not, you know, go back into a hinge, then you know that there's going to be some issues. So you definitely want to note that as well. Yeah. You cover that well. And, you know, just ironically, I'm a person of the knee varus in the sense that when you put me on two legs, my left hip capsule is very tight. So my knee wants to go out, put me on a single leg. If depending on my training is going stuff, I would be more valgus. So again, we, you know, we have to look at both of those. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that you covered it incredibly well. Wow. See, that's another reason why I like this week. So that if you need a feel good week, you should actually do a webinar with Marty. He won't there you go. Very good. <laughs> Always available. <laughs> So, um, so again, on a program design standpoint, considering that's what this is all about, we want to really try to think, well, what do we do about some of these common compensations? And when you're looking at knee valgus, again, that's what the knees slightly turn in. And when we say in, we're looking at the kneecap and it, we want it ideally to be over the second and third toe. If you do not see that and it slightly goes more towards the big toe or more in line with that big toe or even further, then you definitely want to mark that compensation. And so what would cause that? The primary overactive muscles would be the adductor complex, the short head of the bicep femoris, the TFL, the lateral, um, um, vastus lateralis, geez, and then the lateral gastroc. And so because these are more of the overactive muscles, which means it is causing those compensations, we want to spend some time rolling those out or doing some type of, of inhibit technique to try to get proper length 
back into those tissues and then follow that up with static stretching of those. Again, holding those static stretches anywhere from 20 to 30 seconds and making sure that you have ideal alignment when you're doing those. And, um, and the reason I say ideal alignment, because oftentimes, and Marty, you've seen this, even when we teach our workshops, when people start to stretch their calves, if they're, if they're doing a standing calf stretch and they take a step back and their lateral gastroc is overactive, then oftentimes their foot will externally rotate. So at that point, it's very, very important that when you're teaching your client and then when you're watching your client to make sure their feet stay pointed straight ahead or even slightly internally rotate to get more of the lateral gastroc um, throughout that stretch. Um, and then, of course, as soon as you go through and you stretch what was causing those, you have to think you want your brain now to realize, OK, now I've got this newfound length. The underactive muscles need to be woken up and saying, OK, now it's time for you to step in and do your job. And so we want to look at the underactive muscles and provide very anywhere from 12 to 20 repetitions, very slow tempo. So when we say slow, again, we're looking more for, you know, a four to one tempo four being the eccentric. And then, of course, isometric and concentric. So four, two and one. And we suggest and again, you guys can come up with your own ones, but think about what it is you're trying to target. And so, for example, bridges, love bridges, and they are a perfect way to do the glute max. Then you've also included medias too, depending on how you're doing them. And then you've got the ball or cable hamstring uh, curls. So think about in order to really pinpoint the medial hamstring, they would actually be lying on the ground. Their feet are on the on top of the ball. Their toes are pointed straight ahead to start. You're going to get in good alignment. And then from that point, you're going to think to have the big toes touch. So you don't want to actually really focus more on like turning so much in at the hip. So therefore, there's a lot of compensation. Just really focus on taking your legs and turning them in, making sure your, your hips stay neutral. That will help pinpoint more of the medial hamstring itself. And then you're, again, you're going to do the same thing four to one tempos. And then after we go through that, again, we're looking at um, terminal knee extension. That's a really good way to think about the VMO. And the VMO, guys, like I said, is a super, super important muscle that helps track the kneecap. It's one of the very first muscles that in physical therapy they're going to want to try to activate because of that reason. Um, and it's very often it's kind of like the teardrop muscle is what I call it on the knee. So when you're looking at a bodybuilder, it's the one that's right on the medial side. And then, of course, um, focusing on the medial gastroc, because as we said before, the lateral is going to be overactive. Medial will be underactive. So just turning your toes inward and doing calf raises. And then, of course, I'll go ahead and take this one, Marty, and you can get the next one here. But then we go into integration. So remember, now that we've got this new link, now we've activated this one side. Now we need to teach our body how to utilize this newfound LinkedIn movement. So therefore, you can retrain your body how to utilize the muscles the way that they were intended to be utilized by doing integration exercises. And so two that Marty and I really like would be something like a step up to balance. And then if they don't have any compensation at their arms, you could add an overhead press. And then, of course, the band R and T. So when we're talking about banded R and T, we're looking at it's just termed reactive neuromuscular training. So I try to provide a picture here where you can see the trainer or if you have hooks at your gym, you could hook them up with a super band and have somebody actually go against that and then maintain proper alignment. Yep. And the one thing um, that I do is with the me medial hamstring, depending on the facility I'm at, is that's one of the times I like the seated hamstring curl mm -hmm. because I can temporarily lock their femur and they can see ahead of them. Same thing like with a ball curl, they can see. Sometimes when people do prone, they can't see and it ends up becoming more of a problem. So that's one of the times that I'm like, okay, the selectorized piece of equipment is perfect for that. Yes. There's always a time and place. And like I said, it's not that we're against. I know we haven't done much on machines. Maybe, Marty, that's one that we need to do soon. Um, but, you know, because I like them, there is a time and place for everything. It's just because we move in all three planes of motion. Sometimes when we're talking about machines, you know, it puts us mainly in one. But when we're trying to activate specific muscles, those selectorized equipments, um, I think, really do serve a huge purpose at that point. Correct. Awesome job. Thanks, man. So. I'll give you a breather and we'll go into knee varus. Yes. So as we were talking, or as Wendy so eloquently said, this is now where the knees are going to go out. So feet are going to be straight. So again, we have to assume that we've set somebody up in the assessment properly. So again, that's the, the key part of an assessment is establishing it from the beginning. So with this, if you see those knees go out, the piriformis muscle is going to be one of the ones that are overactive. 
the bicep femoris, the TFL, and the glute medius and minimus, because those are muscles that will adduct and or externally rotate when your foot's on the ground. So these are the muscles that we'd want to roll again and static stretch to get them to down regulate. So that way those muscles are more in a relaxed state, not off, but just kind of down regulate. So then now as we go to that other side of the muscles, as you'll see here, we activate to bring everything back into the right position. So a side lying leg raise to hit the adductor complex. Cause yes, on occasion we will target the adductors. Cause if I'm going into abduction, the adductors are in a relatively weakened position. Ball or cable hamstring curl again to get the medial hamstring to pull that back into the center line and then shocking bridges, right? Because <laughs> if there's anything going on with the pelvis, your glutes are going to be under active. So any of your bridge techniques that are appropriate. And again, in this phase, we're looking for higher repetition, 12 to 20, more of that 4 two, one tempo because we want to build the endurance and we want to get those muscles to really work targetedly and know what their job is. And then with integration, if you've been following us, you know that we've the squat to row, right? Because you're unloading the person in a little bit, letting them have some weight in front of them so they can learn how to squat. And then you can drive back through and get that extension of the hips. It's great for posture as well. And allows, for, especially if they do have some restriction in their foot and ankle is simultaneously. And then you can see here a single leg squat to a PNF pattern. If potential, again, work within the range that they can control. And it may even be a single leg balance exercise to begin with, depending on their fitness level. So this just gives, you know, some uh, new opportunities. You will see this. It's not as common as Wendy said, but don't be surprised. And let's not make assumptions on our assessments. Let's make sure we assess them and truly treat them or program for them as what we're seeing in their overhead squat. And one thing I wanted to mention, um, because we did have, you know, the bridges and, and as you you know said, and, and I said earlier too, with the glutes, you know, very, very commonly with the majority of um, the assessments that you see or compensations that you see, the glutes are going to be underactive. And so when we choose the bridges, we do that because clients can actually do this at home. And it's easy because it doesn't require any equipment and it really does target the glutes as long as you're doing it and have them set up correctly. Guys, remember when you're dealing with the knee, if the knee is in valgus or varus, either one, when they go into the bridge, they're going to want to go into those compensations. And so it's very, very important that you maintain the five kinetic chain checkpoints. So watch what's happening. And even if you stand and don't stand in front of them by their feet, stand more like to the side by their head and really kind of look down at their body to make sure the proper alignment is there. And um, at that point, if you notice that somebody has knee varus, as, as Marty just said, meaning their knees commonly go out, when they go into this, they're gonna to wanna to do that again. And so even if you are trying to cue them into it, there's two things you can do. You can ask if you can touch them and you can slightly put your hands on the inside of the medial portion of their knee, have them press against it just a little bit and your hands are in proper alignment of where you want their knees to be. Or you can give them like a small ball or something that's light where they can apply a little bit of pressure working the adductors as they go into the bridge. Um, when it's the other other way around, so when we were talking about valgus, meaning knees caving in, you could slightly put a mini band or something against their, their knees. So therefore they could actually pull their knees out as they go up to maintain proper alignment. Plus you're working the outer hip as the, with the glutes at the same time. So very, very important to really look at the five kinetic chain checkpoints because especially at the knee, when there's a bunch of compensations, they're going to want to do everything to go back into what they know. And it's very important that we're you know, very strict on their movement pattern to make sure everything stays lined in or lined up. And if you say, hey, bring your knees in, they're not going to know how much. And so then they'll bring their knees all the way together. Or if you say, bring your knees out, then it looks like they're giving birth. So just, just you know, I mean, really be smart in, in how you're cueing your clients, but also think about what you can do without having to do a lot of touching to get too close if they're not comfortable with that. Well said. There you have it. There's my, there's my, my lecture for the day. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So uh, when knee dominance, so how do we split this one? I'll start off with the first two sure. parts and we'll let you go into the um, integration part. How's that? Uh, whatever. So, yeah, I'm, I'm good yeah. with that. All right. So as Wendy said, knee dominance can be a couple different things. One, someone just doesn't feel comfortable with an assessment. They don't know what they're asking or being asked to do. And they just squat like this. And again, it could be in a single leg squat or the double leg overhead squat. Generally speaking, 
you know, tell, show, do, just don't over explain it. You can show them what a squat looks like and just say, oh, reach back with your hips just a little bit, one cue, and then see what happens. If you continue to see this, that shows you that the core and glutes are like, I'm not going to hold you up. So I'm going to throw all that weight forward. So clearly there's uh, some weakness there and there's going to be a lot of stress on the knee if we don't address that. So if you truly do see that, what you'd want to target with the foam rolling techniques, self-myofascial techniques and the static stretching would be, depending if it's from the lumbopelvic hip complex, it could be your adductor magnus and piriformis and or if it's from the foot and ankle, it could be the quads and soleus. Now, this is why we have a bunch of different assessments in there. So this would be a great time, especially for two legs, to do the modified overhead squat assessment with the heels elevated. If you still see that, right, then you know it's more from the lumbopelvic hip complex. If it gets cleaned up, you know that, you know, that, I'm sorry, if you, uh, rewind, if it gets cleaned <laughs> up, you know it was from the foot and ankle right? You put, you elevate their heels, things get better. Then you know that you have to dress the foot and ankle. If it doesn't get better, then you know that you have to look at the lumbopelvic hip complex. So that's why we do the modified. Then activate, as we talked about, depends where their compensation is coming from with a lumbopelvic hip complex, shockingly glute max and core. So bridges, bird dogs, planks, all those exercises that you guys know do a great job. And then the foot and ankle would be anterior tib. The glute max again is Wendy just explained why. Core, deep intrinsic, and when we say core, we're talking about the deep intrinsic core stabilizers. That's why we gave exercises such as the bridges and bird dogs and planks. And then, you know, band anterior tib, single leg cobras, single leg squat, pale off presses, et cetera, are phenomenal ways to activate those muscles. Yes. And then of course we go into integration. So let's put it all together. So when we do that, you know, once again, if it's coming from the lumbopelvic hip complex, we're going to look at exercises such as a side lunge to balanced overhead press again. So, you know, think about working more in the frontal plane versus keeping everything so sagitally focused. And then the foot and ankle, we're going to do something such as the single leg balance with reach. Wonderful. There you go. So, and, and I know most of these exercises, guys, you're thinking, wow, we see the same type of exercises almost every week, but they serve such a, you know, huge purpose of helping activate so many small muscles and retraining the brain of how to put things together. That that's why I was saying, if you guys really look at the programs that we've given, look at what's common that we talk about and know that obviously they're common for a reason and they're helping a lot of different things. And so you're only as strong as you are stable. That's why we do stabilization. That's why we focus on these compensations first. You're only going to be as powerful as you are strong. And, and so you can see that's why the OPT model works. And that's why it's always going to be one of the last bullet points that you see. It's all about the model. But the key takeaways, go for it, Marty. Awesome. So first and foremost, why we always start with assessing so we're not guessing is know the muscles and patterns you're targeting. Let's not just exercise. Let's put together training protocols. That's the way I kind of describe it. Obviously, we're exercising, but we don't want just people going to the gym and just kind of picking and poking and, you know, mimicking things. We want people going there with a plan. So when you do the assessment, you know the muscles and the patterns that you need to target. That's where you get the best outcome. So clearly, that's one of the keys. So that ties right into the assessments. Then identify areas causing the faulty movement patterns. So once again, be very targeted with the muscles that are overactive. You can foam roll the entire body, but you if you really want to get the best results, you have to foam roll the overactive tissue and be specific with your static stretching. Not every muscle needs to be stretched statically. That's why we have active and dynamic. Statically, we want to target the muscles that are chronically short and causing the bad motion. So we need to be very specific with that or we won't get the results we want. And then just like anything else, you can design the best program, but if you don't have proper setup, and the proper movement and execution, then you're only kind of halfway there by putting it down on paper. So we've got to make sure that we get what we wrote down and we get the outcome in the gym with the person's form and technique. And that includes acute variables as well, right? The right amount of sets, the right amount of tempo, the right tempos, the right uh, work to rest ratio, or the, the, the rest intervals, all of that does count to get the best program. And then the model, as we always say, is your friend. Know when to progress people through move well, then move well under load, then you can move well at high speeds. Yes. 
Very well done. <laughs> so hopefully, and, and again, these are just some of the, the common compensations. I mean, again, with it being a hinge joint and shouldn't be moving in a ton of different uh, frontal plane or transverse motion, you can see these are going to be the primary compensations that you'll see. And if you do, hopefully this program will help you guys um, and help your clients. Don't overthink it. Just think about what are you seeing in your compensation or, you know, in your assessments, mark it down, use your solutions table, because I know Marty and I can ramble off this stuff, but guys, remember we started out not knowing a lot of this stuff too. And so that solutions table has really helped me in my career and it's okay to have it on the back of your clipboard. If you're new to some of this stuff um, until this starts to become second nature and because we call them common compensations, you're going to start to see them very often. And so then you're going to be able to rattle it off just as quickly as we do. Um, but if you have any questions, you know, feel free to type them into the comments right now and we'll take those. However, if you don't and you want to email Marty or myself, I think Deborah, you asked what our email addresses are. Um, my email is wendy.bats at nasm.org or you can message me on Instagram at wendy.bats13. And then mine is marty.miller at nasm.org and Instagram is dr.martymiller72. So Wendy, uh, not sure if any questions will come in, but if you can let everybody know about your amazing podcast while we're waiting to see if any questions come in. Yes, I do a podcast with another uh, regional master instructor. So another one of my colleagues that I adore, which is another Miller. Um, so I do it with Ken Miller. It is a podcast called Random Fit, where we talk about everything randomly about fitness. And so, you know, you can find us anywhere that you download podcasts. So on Google and Spotify, you can just download and listen to some of the fun topics that we have. And as always, if there's something you want us to, to research and look up, we're always happy to do that, but they're usually a lot of fun. And Marty, awesome. you've got your coffee talks. Yes. On, um, Tuesdays, uh, between nine, nine 30, you know, sometimes we're going, we go live. <laughs> So, but they are recorded and then you'll find them on IGTV. So I'm there with no agenda. The agenda is that we're going to hang out and talk and answer questions as you guys uh, send them to me live. So it's kind of fun that way because it's not something that, you know, is going to be dictated by what I want to communicate. It's dictated back to me by what you want me to communicate and talk about. So we have a really good uh, network of people that uh, are pretty consistent with it and or watch it and then email me. So uh, we have a lot of fun with it. So I really enjoy it. Yes. Well, Marty, we got two questions. So I'm going to go yeah. ahead and hit you up on the first one, but it says, what if only one knee is knocked? One of the things is first, we're going to start with medical history. We're going to start with, did they ever have an injury and, or is that causing them problems and, or have they ever seen medical advice and do they have, uh, are they authorized in a sense or free to exercise? So when we figure all that in, if everything checks out and I just see the movement compensation on one side and there's no pain, no discomfort, no previous injuries, I don't need to check with anybody from the medical side of things, I would treat that one side of the body differently, just like our asymmetrical shift. So if I have to do the adductor on that side and not the adductor on the other side, that's okay. We don't want to just randomly do things because then we may not get the changes that we need to see. So your assessment will dictate it, whether it's both sides, one side. But if you see that, there's probably some other things going on. So go back and check the asymmetrical shift in the content that we put out there. Mm -hmm. And that kind of brings us into the next one. Linda asked, you know, do we need to memorize the solutions table for the exam? And so Marty's going to say yes. I'm going to say you don't have to memorize it. And no. that's just it. You don't want to memorize it. But it is fair game for someone to say, you know, when you're doing this exercise, what's the prime mover? What's the antagonist? Um, you know, or, you know, what muscles, if you see this in a, uh, you know, compensation, what muscles may be causing the compensation or what muscles are allowing it. And remember when they say cause, that means overactive. When it says allowing, that means underactive. And so you really want to have a very clear understanding of what muscles are causing and allowing those compensations. So do you need to memorize it? No. Do you need to know it? Yes. <laughs> okay. So read between whatever that means. I'll be the honest one. I don't know how to interpret that. I don't there, either. <laughs> there will be questions on it. And all we are saying is if you look at the compensations, you're, and again, this could take me seriously 10 seconds. Starting from the ground up, there's going to be certain muscles that are always going to fall into the overactive category. And there's going to be certain muscles that always fall into the underactive category. So lateral gastroc the TFL, the bicep femoris short head, the hip flexor complex, the adductor complex, lat and pec, and then their, your sternocleidomastoid are going to be primarily always overactive. 
Then when you go underactive, we got the anterior tip, posterior tip, glute medius, glute max, deep intrinsic core stabilizers, rhomboids, mid trap, low trap, and the deep cervical flexor. So though, you know, you're going to see the patterning and I did forget the pec is overactive, um, I believe in the first section. So when you can put them into those two columns, it becomes less intimidating. Mm -hmm. And that's all I mean by, I would memorize it, figure out what tends to always be overactive, what tends to always be underactive. And then when you go into that exam, you know what bucket they fall into. So the question shouldn't be tricky at that point. Well said. Yes. No, Not that they're have... tricky, but I don't want you to overthink it. I want you to know which bucket they go into. Yeah. And don't stress so much about origin and insertion. It's yes. Just what yeah. do they do, you know, and just know those muscles. And so, and as you continuously look at it, you know, just think about too, if, even if you have to stand up in the middle of your test and it's asking about foot yeah. externally rotate and you turn your foot out and you're like, okay, wait a minute, my lateral gastroc is closer to my foot. So that's probably overactive. And the other side is probably, that's okay to look at yeah. your own body. Don't look at someone else's or you may get in trouble. However, if you focus on yourself and you start to like move around, that's fine. Cause I'm very visual. I like to do that kind of stuff. So anyway, hopefully that cool. helps. <laughs> Awesome. So as always, Wendy, it's been a blast. I look forward to next week. So thank yes. you everyone for attending and we hope to see you again next week on our uh, Master Instructor Roundtable. Thanks guys.